Hello, my name is Dom Hagdahl, and welcome to the FHS Veterans Day Ceremony, where we celebrate the past, present, and future heroes of our country. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, everyone. If you would please find your seats. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to our Veterans Day program 2021. First and foremost, let's begin by recognizing all those among us who have been part of the great brotherhood and sisterhood we call the U.S. military. Our veterans, active duty service members, guardsmen, and reservists. Your service and your sacrifice have kept our country safe and free. If you are able, please stand and be recognized. Now would everyone please stand for the posting of our colors.
Okay, hello everybody. My name is Lily. You're welcome to have a seat for now. Um, my name is Lily Balfour. I am a senior here at Fairmont High School. I am also currently enlisted in the Army National Guard, but I just came here today to tell you a little bit about Veterans Day. So the following open remarks are coming from the American Legion. 70 years ago, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed what many historians consider the greatest social legislation ever passed by the U.S. Congress. As popular as the GI Bill remains today, it took the horrific cost and bloodshed of World War II to remind many Americans just how great a debt is owed to our veterans. In 1932, thousands of World War I veterans camped out in Washington, D.C. to petition their government for bonuses that they felt were owed. Their campsite was forcibly overrun by the U.S. Army, and at least two veterans were killed by the police. President Franklin Roosevelt told the American Legion National Convention in 1933 that, quote, no person, because he wore a uniform, must thereafter be placed in a special class of, of beneficiaries over and above other citizens. While Roosevelt would later prove himself to be a great wartime commander-in-chief, what he and others failed to realize at the time is that veterans were not asking to be part of a special class. They just wanted a shot at the American dream that they fought so hard to defend. Most Americans profess to truly love our veterans, especially at gatherings like this on Veterans Day and Memorial Day. And while their feelings are usually sincere, it is important to remember that veterans are defending us 365 days a year. The heroism that has been demonstrated time and again by veterans from the American Revolution to the global war on terrorism is sometimes unnoticed by those of us who enjoy the security that their sacrifice has provided. Army Staff Sergeant Clinton Romashaw has seen war at its very worst. While serving at combat outpost Keating in Afghanistan, he and his comrades were awakened to an attack by an estimated 300 enemy fighters on October 3, 2009. According to his Medal of Honor citation, Staff Sergeant Romashaw took out an enemy machine gun team and engaged in taking out a second when he received shrapnel wounds from a rocket-propelled grenade, and yet he continued to fight on. He killed at least three other Taliban fighters and directed air support to destroy 30 other enemy fighters. After receiving the na nation's highest military medal, Staff Sergeant Romasaw said he felt confl conflicted. The joy, he said, comes from recognition of us doing our jobs as soldiers on distant battlefields, but is countered by the constant reminder of the loss of our battle buddies, my battle buddies, my soldiers, my friends. Staff Sergeant Romashaw's attitude is not hard to find among the living Medal of Honor recipients. They will never forget the sacrifice of their friends, and neither will the Gold Star families who will have to cope without the embrace of their loved ones. The innocence of their grieving children will be challenged by the dramatic change affecting the balance of security and comfort in their family routine. The hearts of these families will feel the sharp sting of their loss, leaving them only with memories of their loving mom or dad. Life as they have known it will be much harder from now on. Our debt to these heroes can never be repaid, but our gratitude and respect must last for forever. For many veterans, our nation was important enough to endure long separations from their families, miss the births of their children, freeze in sub-zero temperatures, bake in wild jungles, lose limbs, and far too often lose lives. Military spouses have had to endure career interruptions, frequent changes of address, and a disproportionate share of parental responsibilities. The children often had to deal with changes in school, separation from friends, and hardest of all, the uncertainty of whether or not mom or dad will live through their next combat tour. Those who defend us from our enemies must be supported. Whether their service was in Baghdad or Beirut, we need to serve veterans as well as they serve us, even when the guns have temporarily stopped firing. Veterans don't ask for much. They don't want to be in a special class, but benefits are a mere drop in the bucket compared to the financial and human costs of war. And while not all veterans see war, all who served in the military have expressed a willingness to fight if called to do so. Historians have said that Dwight Eisenhower was prouder of being a soldier than he was of being the president. And while relatively few veterans ever reach the rank of general, pride in one's military service is a bond shared by nearly all who have served. This pride is on display at every obituary page in the country where military service, regardless of how many decades have passed and subsequent achievements reached, is mentioned with the death notice of nearly every deceased veteran. Veterans have given us freedom, security, and the greatest nation on earth. It is impossible to put a price on that. 
We must remember them. We must appreciate them. And we must honor them. Thank you, veterans, for your service. Now, if you will all stand and please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance and National Anthem. You may be seated. Alexander Jefferson, Army fighter pilot, 100 years old, Detroit, Michigan. When Alexander Jefferson was shot down over Nazi-occupied southern France on August 12, 1944, he'd never, he'd never parachuted before, though he'd flown 18 combat missions with the 332nd Fighter Group part of the famed African-American pilots and support personnel who became known as the Tusky Airmen. Jefferson remembered to let the plane pass him before pulling the ripcord, otherwise the parachute can get tied up in the plane and you'll get dragged to your death. Bruised and scraped, but with nothing broken, he landed in a tree. Hearing German, being black, and knowing the Nazis' racism, I said, oh brother, here we go. Of his eight months captivity with fellow American pilots in desegregated quarters, he remembers decent food from the Red Cross and adequ adequate medical care. He and fellow pilots visited Dachau immediately after the liberation. He remembers piles of bodies. Man's inhumanity to man, I can't even describe it, he said. Everything you hear is true. Jefferson became a grade school science teacher, assistant principal and author of a memoir Red tail captured, red tail free. His advice, no place is going to be perfect, so love your country and preserve democratic life here. Keep your nose to the grinding mill, get an education, and vote. Nell Bright, pilot, 100 years old, Salt Lake City, Utah. Born and raised near Amarillo, Texas, Bright flew an open cockpit World War I era plane with her dad when she was eight and vowed one day to become a pilot. At 19, she read about Jacqueline Cochran, the famous aviator who ran and helped establish the Women Air Force Service Pilots Program, famously nicknamed WASP, and Bright applied. Mostly in their late teens and early 20s, 
The WASPs were female volunteers who took military flying jobs in the United States to free up men for overseas combat during World War II. A pilot's license was required, and of the 25,000 women that applied, only 1,879 were accepted, and 1,074 got their wings. Bright flew strafing missions in the desert. She flew twin-engine beach airplanes, training male pilots to use searchlights. She towed targets behind B-25 and B-26 bombers to help the men practice shooting using live ammunition, one of the more dangerous exercises. We couldn't believe we were getting paid to fly the airplanes we wanted to fly, she recalled. Many of us, during the Depression, did without lunch to pay for flying lessons, but we wanted to help our country. When her older brother, an Army pilot who had been stationed in Italy, was discharged, she got permission to fly him home to Amarillo. He said, oh no, I'll take the bus. My little sister can't do anything. She flew him home anyway. Her advice for future generations is simply use your common sense. Chuck Meacham, Marine Raider, 96, Gig Harbor, Washington. Meacham served for two years as a U.S. Marine Raider in the battles of Guam, Bougainville, Emera, and Okinawa. Trained, trained in beach and ocean landing, artillery, and hand-to-hand -hand combat, Raiders endured grueling physical conditions. On Bougainville, Meacham evaded Japanese snipers hiding out in coconut trees and took turns with a fellow Marine to hold the other's head out of swamp water so each could live. On Okinawa, Raiders tra traversed 25 miles a day on foot, cumul cumulating in a three-hour firefight at Montebu Peninsula. He said, in our firefights, there were no enemy survivors. Sleeping in foxholes, Meacham developed a 105 fever and was evacuated by plane. I opened my eyes and I saw a flight nurse. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. He went on to a distinguished career, U.S. Commissioner of Fish and Wildlife. He recently helped raise funds for a school building on the island of Tulagi, where Marine Raiders first came ashore in the Guadalcanal campaign and natives helped U.S. troops take back their island. If the Japanese found out they were helping us, they killed them, so we are thanking him. His advice, get educated. At that time, to fight was our duty, and we did the best we could. George Hardy, Army fighter pilot, 96 years old, from Sarasota, Florida. A highly decorated member of the Tuskegee Airmen, the first black aviators in the US Army, Hardy flew 21 combat missions over Germany in World War II. Guarding American bombers, he chased a few Nazi fighter pilots away. Taking his cue from Benjamin O. Davis, Jr., founder and commander of the Tuskegee Airmen, Hardy viewed himself as a protector. Davis said, do not leave the bombers. We stuck with them. Wishing to serve in the Navy with a beloved older brother, Hardy learned that it was segregated and he'd have to work in food service. So he set his sights on what was then called the Army's Tuskegee Experiment. He said, I don't want race to be a problem. I passed all the tests. Just 17, he focused on listening and following instructions. He applied himself, saying getting off the ground into the clouds, it was lovely. He doesn't recall feeling scared, rather empowered. He wasn't the big guy growing up, but the skinny guy, which helped make him an ideal fighter pilot. They'd pick bigger guys for the twin engine planes, he said, whereas fighter pilots were smaller guys. Single engine, you control everything. Training to fly P-51 Mustangs, which lent the 332nd its Red Tails nickname for the color on its plane's tails, Hardy recalls a friend letting him drive his luxurious LaSalle back to the barracks in Walterboro, South Carolina. The hitch? The newly minted fighter pilot had never driven an automobile. Hardy went on to a distinguished career as an Air Force combat pilot. His advice, avoid extremism, listen. Herschel Woody Williams, 98 years old, combat Marine, Charleston, West Virginia. Herschel Woody Williams is the last living World War II veteran recipient and the oldest living recipient of the Medal of Honor the military's highest decoration for valor in combat. In 1943, as a Marine infantryman, Williams was trained in demolition and using flamethrowers. 
Sent to the South Pacific, he fought in the Battle of Guan, then the Battle of Iwo Jima, where he fought Japanese firing on U.S. soldiers from reinforced concrete pillboxes, then vanquished enemy soldiers who rushed him with bayonets. Fighting hand to hand for over four hours, he helped give the Marines a foothold on the day the U.S. flag was raised at Iwo Jima. After he was presented the Medal of Honor by President Harry S. Truman on October 5, 1945, Williams went on to serve in the Marine Corps Reserves and as a Veterans Affairs Counselor. On March 7, 2020, a Navy warship, the USS Herschel Woody Williams, was named after him. And his advice? So many of our citizens have sacrificed their lives for the precious gift of freedom. If we do not preserve that freedom, it will go away. Lieutenant Colonel Carl C. Johnson, Army fighter pilot, age 95, Ashbourne, Virginia. As a boy, watching the mail plane fly down the Ohio River from his hometown of Bel Air to Cincinnati, Carl C. Johnson was fascinated by aircraft. But it wasn't until high school when he and a football buddy asked about enlisting in the Army. Then he thought of becoming a pilot. My friend, who was white, received a notification, and they didn't call me, recalled Johnson. I first felt discrimination. In college at Ohio State, he was drafted and tapped for what was called the Tuskegee Experiment, ultimately known as the Tuskegee Airmen, compromised of almost 1,000 pilots and many thousands more support personnel. This unit escorted mostly white bomber pilots in combat, with an above average rate success rate at the time when the U.S. military was segregated. Training was rigorous, and Johnson was one of 12 in his class of 119 to make it to phase four. He completed his training in a special program for pilots from China, then a United States ally. After graduation, along with his Tuskegee Airmen wings, Johnson received Chinese wings from the Chinese President Zheng Kaoshek for helping communicate instructions to the Chinese flying B-25 twin engine planes. I was an instructor for them, more or less, he recalled. As a decorated Army pilot in the Korean and Vietnam Wars, Johnson later became deputy director of the Pittsburgh International Airport in 1970s. His advice, I stress education. You've got to prepare yourself. Try to be open-minded. That's difficult, but important. Julia Parsons, Navy codebreaker, 100 years old, Forest Hills, Pennsylvania. World War II brought Julia Parsons a unique opportunity. After finishing college at Carnegie Mellon, then Carnegie Tech, in her hometown of Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, Parsons had wished to be an engineer. They laughed at me. They didn't offer women many opportunities back then, she says. Instead, she joined the U.S. Naval Reserve's WAVES, Women Accepted for Volunteer Emergency Service. After acing an aptitude test, the Navy sent her to Washington, D.C. to serve as a codebreaker. Someone asked if anyone knew German, Parsons recalled. I raised my hand, said yes. I'd taken two years of German in high school. While that got her into a top secret unit, she rarely employed her German in. Cracking codes rather than the work was more mathematical and, using, and involved using an early computer. With American ships bringing crucial supplies to England being sunk by German U-boats, the work was urgent. It was our duty to break the code and find out what the messages from German subs were saying, Parsons recalled. Sometimes we could, sometimes we couldn't. Work was strictly classified. She couldn't tell her family or friends what she did. I didn't tell my husband until the late 1990s. He was annoyed, but I said, what difference does it make now? After the war, she, began, she became a wife, mother, and high school English teacher. Her advice, I just wanted to do something. Everyone wanted to do something, and everyone did. It's amazing what a country can do when people are united. Paul Cohen, Army Forward Observer, 100 years old, Los Angeles, California. Trained for amphibious warfare due to considerable anti-Semitism, Cohen transferred to a cannon company as a forward observer. His role was to go to an observation point on higher ground with a radio officer to report what he saw and call orders to the tanks. He said, in the old company, they'd say, you're Jewish. You're supposed to be in an office with a typewriter. I said, first of all, I can't type, and second, no job is too tough for me. 
On Okinawa, he and his platoon leader, James Owens, went into a village to assess enemy presence when Japanese forces let loose with machine gun fire, saying, it lifted me off the ground. Owens, bleeding profusely, was unable to walk. Cohen carried him back through heavy fire to a first aid station, saying, at 24, I could lift a building, earning Cohen the Bronze Star for bravery. He has remained active in World War II veterans organizations and in 2013 was named Los Angeles County Veteran of the Year. His advice is think before you vote. What's going to be good for you? Will it benefit your future or harm your future? Joseph Donut, Navy gunner, aged 100, Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Born in Abruzzi, Italy, Donna immigrated with his family to the United States at age three. At 19, as World War II broke out, he received a letter from Mussolini asking him if he wanted to serve in the Italian army. But, loving America, he adamantly refused. I said, they're not going to draft me. I joined. He served as a gunner on the USS Suwanee, a Navy aircraft carrier that provided escort to supply ships supporting the Marines on Guadalcanal and fought in 14 battles, including the Battle of Leyte Gulf, where his ship was hit by the kamikaze pilot, knocking Dona out and earning him a Purple Heart. The kamikazes, they came right down. We manned the guns. I don't know if I shot one down. I'm sure I helped. Next thing you know, I'm on a pile of guys, and they're dead. He remembers medics, lacking morphine, offering him wine. He recalls good times amid the terror, including listening to Tokyo Rose, a Japanese propaganda broadcast featuring American songs that tried to hurt the morale, crooning, boys, guess what your wives and girlfriends are doing now? Donna, who met his wife of 72 years, Marie, a codebreaker, before shipping out, remembers he and his buddies weren't easily spooked. We said, she's probably having more fun than me. His advice, love your country. Johnny A. Jones, Sr., Army Warrant Officer, 102, on November 30th, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The second African-American Warrant Officer in the U.S. Army, Jones was drafted while studying at Southern University in Baton Rouge and commenced his duties in desegregated quarters in New Orleans. Transferred to South Carolina, assigned to a separate filthy barracks, he made his case to Brigadier General James T. Duke, scion of a North Carolina tobacco company. He and white officers had bunked together in New Orleans. Duke arranged for Jones to stay at a boarding house in Charleston instead. Jones recalls that time fondly. On D-Day and at the Battle of the Bulge, Jones managed equipment, supplies, and fellow soldiers' belongings. He returned personal effects to men who survived and to the families of the fallen. In 2021, he belatedly received the Purple Heart for his injuries sustained at D-Day when his ship, the Francis C. Harrington, hit a mine. Jones was proud to serve but was dismayed on return. As soon as he crossed the Mason-Dixon line, he once again faced segregation. As an attorney, his long career included representing the architects of the Baton Rouge bus boycott and a term as a Louisiana state representative. His advice, stay in school and follow the principles of Christianity. You just heard war stories of veterans compiled from the New York Post's Wisdom of Heroes. 13 World War II Veterans Give Advice to Young Americans by Heather Robinson. These veterans served in a variety of roles during World War II. This may be a final opportunity to hear from them. Men and women of grit, resourcefulness, and courage who saved the world for future generations of Americans. Many stress unity, so essential in achieving victory. According to codebreaker Julia Parsons, everyone wanted to do something. And everyone did. As Americans emerge from upheaval amid the global pandemic and a deep political divide, the wisdom of these vets is more needed than ever. Fortunately, this Veterans Day, these warriors can still speak to us, and we still have a chance to listen. Now, would you please give a warm Fairmont High School welcome to our speaker for today, Colonel Kathy Reynolds. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me to speak today. Let me start out by saying 
Happy 246th birthday to my fellow Marines. On November 10th, 1775, the Marine Corps was founded. Each year, the Marine Corps celebrates this day as a chance to remember the history and legacy of the Marine Corps. It is a history of Marines who have dedicated their lives to the service of the nation, a group of a few proud people who are bound together by their oath to serve their country. The Marines make up just one small part of our armed forces that serve our country. And today we are here to talk about all of our veterans. There are approximately 19 million veterans in the United States. They make up less than 10% of the adult population. They are the men and women of our nation that have stepped forward to serve in our armed forces and defend our freedoms. They have risked their lives for the land, for the people, and for the ideals that we all cherish. We each owe a debt of gratitude to the veterans who are willing to step into the breach for their country and for the cause of freedom. America is the country she is because of her heroes, past and present. People who put the nation's interest above self-interest, who put patriotism above profit, and who put the love of country above love of self. So why did they serve our country? What did they do? When you see a veteran today, go beyond saying thank you for your service and ask them their story. While each veteran's story will be unique, you will find some common threads. Serve their country, travel and see the world, challenge their self, and be part of something bigger than yourself. I challenge you to talk to the veterans here today and around our community. Find out their stories and find the common themes. Let me start your search by telling you a little bit about my story. I grew up on a farm in rural southeastern Iowa in a community of about 900. In high school, I was involved with sports, band, chorus, drama, student government, and various other school activities. I completed a summer foreign exchange program to Denmark, and I spent the second half of my senior year working at the state capitol instead of attending high school. Throw in working on the farm, teaching Sunday school, and having a job, I managed to stay busy. When I left high school, I knew I wanted to help people, serve my country and my community, and work in government. I had looked at joining the military reserves in high school, but at 17, my parents would have to sign, and they did not support that decision. Unlike the decisions to go to participate in a foreign exchange program and taking off half of my senior year to work at the state capitol, this was one decision that I could not sway their opinions on. So off to college I went with the thought of the military service still in my back of my mind. In college, I majored in political science and history with an intent to go to law school. I still wasn't sure where life was going to take me until one day I saw the Marine Corps recruiter at the school. I learned that I could serve in the Marines and still go to law school. It was the perfect opportunity. Serve my country, practice law, challenge myself, and be part of something much bigger than myself. A few weeks later, I signed my contract. My family still thought I was crazy. It was a good idea for someone else, but not for me, not for a female. They thought there were other directions that I should go with my life. Their initial show of support was to conclude that I was just stubborn enough to make it through. Sometime during my senior year, or during my initial years of service, I see people laughing at me down there, they know my story. Um, sometime during my initial years of service, their opinions changed, and they became supporters of the decision as they saw how it challenged me to be and do more. In officer candidate school, boot camp for officers, my platoon started with 77 females. We were told no more than 30 would graduate. Our staff repeatedly told us that, and just a couple weeks in, we were well on our way to making that mark. It motivated us to push ourselves beyond what we thought were our limits. We had to prove to ourselves and to our staff that we belonged. Our platoon happily proved our staff wrong, and we graduated around 35 female officers that year. During boot camp, you learn to push yourself beyond your limits. You realize that you set your limits that are safe, 
But when you push to see how much you are really capable of, you change. You gain confidence, determination, and motivation to push those limits to be your best, not just safe, not only for you, but for those around you, your brothers and sisters at arms are depending on you. My first duty station was at Camp Pendleton, California, where I spent time as a legal assistance attorney and then a criminal defense attorney. After two years, I found myself assigned to the 1st Marine Division, home of approximately 20,000 of the Marine Corps' finest infantry forces. And yes, I am a little biased. I was assigned as the Deputy Staff Judge Advocate, the number two attorney responsible for advising the Commanding General and providing legal guidance for the entire division. I was in a position that called for an officer with three to five more years experience than me. I was the lowest ranking deputy on the staff and was one of only three female officers in the division. As a young female officer in a male dominated infantry world, I learned quickly to be strong, have thick skin, be confident, be informed, and don't be afraid to speak up. My role was to make sure decisions were informed and legal requirements followed, even when that didn't make me the most unpopular person in the room. It was often uncomfortable, and I had to provide guidance that they often didn't want to hear, especially from a female, but you gained confidence and respect for doing the right thing. Following my tour with the 1st Marine Division, I trans transitioned off active duty and moved cross country to Washington, DC. I soon went back on active duty, serving at the Pentagon, where I was stationed on 9-11. I wasn't in the Pentagon that morning, but instead was at a law firm in downtown DC. Sorry. And I was involved in environmental negotiations. Yes, the joys of being in the military and as a lawyer, you still do all these things that you do out in the private world. We learned of the planes crashing into the Twin Towers by an individual participating in the meeting via phone from his home in California. We sat in shock as he told us about the plane hitting the Twin Towers, and the first tower, then the second tower, and before we recovered from that news, he told us about the plane hitting the Pentagon. And that one was en route to the Capitol. The last plane eventually landed in a field in Pennsylvania. My husband was a Marine Corps reservist, and he worked for a US senator and was at the Capitol. We had a son who was at the Pentagon's daycare, hence why I remain emotional. My heart stopped beating for a moment with the news, and we stopped the meeting so we could focus on what was happening around us. I walked 15 miles that day in high heels and a business suit across Washington, D.C. to the Navy Yard, where I had to convince a guard to let me onto the base to get my car. Then I went to the Pentagon. I walked through the middle of the recovery crash site for the Pentagon, and eventually made it to my son, who had been evacuated <laughs> from the daycare by a group of young Marines who stopped to help the daycare staff as they evacuated and made their way to safety. About three o'clock that afternoon, my husband, our two sons, and I made it back to our house to watch the horror unfold on TV. A few days later, I called my parents to come out from Iowa and pick up my kids. The next day, they showed up, took our two boys, and went back to Iowa, where they spent the next few weeks before my husband and I could bring them back to Washington, D.C. with us. Our youngest son, spent his first birthday with his grandparents while mom and dad served their country. Today, he's a junior in college as a Marine option with the R Navy ROTC. We'll go back to why is he going to serve? He has two parents who have served their country and he lived through 9-11 at the Pentagon's daycare. While he is too young to remember that day, he knows the story well and has shaped his life and his decision to serve his country. Fast forward a couple of years, and I was mobilized to an organization whose mission it was to train our senior Marine Corps officers 
or staff deploying to Iraq and Afghanistan. We trained them on operational planning, preparing them for missions in country. When the war in Iraq started, I watched the battle unfold on TV, having played out every scenario our troops faced and knowing what would come next. While in the organization, I ran the daily operations so our director and deputy director could stay focused on the training mission. During training events, I would work as the legal advisor, advising on the rules of engagement, law of war, international law, and how the treaties and conventions our country and our partner countries have signed affect our operations. When planning an operation with our partner countries, you find situations where one country can do something, but another cannot due to the treaties and conventions they are part of. This complicates planning and understanding the intricacies and nuances of military operations and the effects of international law are paramount to a successful operation. When I left this position, I was recruited to deploy to Djibouti, Africa, to serve as the administrative officer and the deputy staff judge advocate. While there, I quickly found myself moved into the executive officer's position, which put me as the number two person in charge of our camp. It was a small city of approximately 2,000 service members. The mission in Djibouti, Africa, and surrounding African countries or, was best described as the hearts and minds campaign of the global war on terror. We did operations in Djibouti and the surrounding African countries to build relations with the countries and the local population to help prevent Al-Qaeda from setting up training camps in Africa. Upon returning to the States, I was asked to stand up a unit at Bethesda National Naval Medical Center. The unit was tasked with supporting our wounded Marines returning from Iraq and Afghanistan with their recovery. We would connect with families and bring them out to support their loved ones through their recovery. We worked with the medical staff and families to understand and plan the recovery and rehabilitation path our wounded, for our wounded and provided logistics supports for donations and volunteers. One of my favorite stories was watching a young sergeant lead and take care of his Marines. His unit had been caught in an ambush in Iraq, and several of them sustained serious injuries. His brother was also a Marine and in Iraq, and was part of the quick reaction force that was sent to support their withdrawal from contact and to evacuate the wounded. The sergeant's brother placed him on a helicopter to evacuate him from the scene. The wounded were evacuated to Germany and then to Bethesda, where my unit was located. We brought the family out, and mom stayed with the sergeant. As the sergeant was recovering, he would constantly ask about his Marines and how they were doing. He would send his mom to go check on them. Once he could get up, she pushed his wheelchair up and down the hallway to check on his Marines. Eventually, when he could walk, he went from room to room motivating and checking on his Marines. Mom stayed by his side and supported his recovery while he supported his Marines. The whole time mom was doing this, she still had her other son in Iraq, still in harm's way, and a younger son who was at home in high school that was enlisting in the Marines. Each day we had the privilege of watching this sergeant grow and represent the values of service above self and the selfless caring for his Marines over concerns for his own safety. These are the values and commitments that keep me in the service. These are the bonds of brotherhood that we have with our fellow veterans that keep us giving back and staying engaged with our veteran community. Another Marine we worked with lost both of his legs, severely injured one of his arms, and lost his vision. The recovery was lengthy, and I was just a part of his first step of his journey. We helped him and his family through multiple surgeries, pain, and denial. When he was ready to move for his next phase of recovery, we wished him well and prayed for the best. A few months after he left, he came back to thank everyone that had been part of his care team. He was motivated, thankful, and ready for life's next challenges. It was amazing to be part of these Marines' lives and watch the courage and strength they displayed throughout their recoveries. Throughout this, or following this tour, I spent more time training troops deploying to Iraq and Afghanistan, and then transitioned to training judge advocates, Marines, and partner country forces on legal obligations during conflict based on national and international laws, regulations, treaties, conventions, and norms. Working to ensure that all knew their legal and ethical boundaries in the face of hostilities. Throughout my 29 years of service to country, 
I have served across the U.S., from the west to the east coast, from the northeast to the south. I've traveled to Okinawa, Japan, Thailand, Australia, Djibouti, Africa, and Bahrain. I've worked with partner countries from across the world. I have watched the Marine Corps go from less than 1% of the officer corps being female to 7.5% of the officer corps being female today, with an overall female end strength of officer and enlisted of 8.4%. While this may seem small, the progress this shows is no small achievement. Throughout my years of service, my philosophy has remained service above self, community over individual, and betterment of the whole. My values remain embodied in those of the Marine Corps of honor, courage, and commitment. As stated by General Douglas MacArthur, duty, honor, country. Those three hallowed words reverently dictate what you ought to be, what you can be, and what you will be. Remember, today is a chance to recognize and thank our veterans for their service to our country. Their service is what has made our country and the freedoms that you enjoy possible. But do more than thank them. Ask them when they served, why they served, and what they did. You will learn more about personal perseverance, integrity, valor, humility, kinship, and patriotism in a short conversation than you ever thought possible. Learn why we celebrate our veterans today. As President John F. Kennedy said, as we express our gratitude, we must never forget that the highest appreciation is not to utter the words, but to live by them. Thank you, and thank you to my brothers and sisters in arms across our country.
Please join me in thanking uh, Kathy Reynolds once again for our speaker today. Now please, if you would stand and stay standing as we observe a moment of silence for those veterans who are no longer with us and for those who lost their lives defending our country. Thank you everyone for attending our Veterans Day program 2021. Veterans, thank you. Thank you for your service. We are inviting you up to our commons, so students, please stay where you are and allow our veterans to be dismissed.
There you go, FHS. There was your 2021 Veterans Ceremony. Thank you.